It is a land washed by the seas on every side. Millions of years of primeval movement formed this island. Earthquakes broke it up, volcanic eruption healed it over, and the long, quiet centuries wore its mountains down. Strange tigers and prehistoric animals made the island their home. Here, a primitive race of men lived and died without disturbing its peace for thousands of years. Then, in 1642, Abel Tasman wrote, Item the 25th November. This land, being the first land we have met with in the South Sea, and not known to any European nation, we have conferred on it the name of Antony van Diemen's Land. Today it is Tasmania, the island state of the Commonwealth of Australia. The first white settlement was at Risdon Cove, founded by Lieutenant Bowen in September 1803. One year later, Lieutenant Colonel Collins moved the settlement closer to the seaboard and called it Hobart. In the north, Colonel Patterson founded a colony at Port Dalrymple. In 1806, this was also moved to the present site of Launceston. Now was the time for discovery. Explorers travelled in all directions to determine the nature of the land. Rivers were traced, mountains named, geological and botanical specimens collected, noted, named and found. It was a rich adventure for those who revealed the secrets of such a promising land. Axes rang forth from the stillness of a million years and a new way of life was created. Houses were built and gardens planted with English trees and flowers. Holdings in the alien bush became homes. After the early exertion of hewing a life out of virgin scrub, some settlers prospered, living a life that was gracious, well-ordered and comfortable. For land was cheap and seasons good. Labour in the form of ticket-of-leave convicts was plentiful and a life of ease and luxury was built up. But there was another side. Van Diemen's land was also a prison. Shiploads of wretched convicts were poured into the penal settlements to suffer floggings, hunger and misery. Today, Port Arthur is the only substantial ruin in Australia. The slow hand of time has obliterated much of the harshness. Small flowers blossom out of the stones. Oak trees and hawthorn shade prison walls and barred windows. Now a post office, this was once the rectory of the famous church which was designed by a convict architect, James Blackburn, but never consecrated. In 1853, transportation of convicts ceased. The happier name of Tasmania was substituted for that of Van Diemen's Land, honouring Abel Tasman, its original discoverer. Agriculturally, the possibilities were limitless in this rich island. The chocolate-coloured volcanic soil of the northwest, the savanna country of the east, the rich river valleys, all blessed with an assured rainfall and a good climate, helped the new Tasmania to an early prosperity.
crops were first planted at Providence Valley, now North Hobart, in 1822. Since that time, hop growing has been a feature of the Derwent Valley, particularly near New Norfolk. At picking time, the whole family joins in the work, making a pleasant tableau among the sweet-smelling plants growing from thick, friable soil. The figures of children at play and grown-ups at work are so intent, so much at peace with the world in this green-curtained haven. The Huon Valley, world-renowned for its apple exports, was once deemed unworthy of settlement. In 1804, the Deputy Surveyor General said, the soil itself is sufficient to deter any experiment being made as to settlement. In 1808, John Oxley said, it is impossible to imagine a more miserable country. There is some good land, but none that would repay the trouble of getting to it. Yet this miserable country is now the most prolific apple growing area in the Commonwealth, some of it yielding more than 1,000 bushels of marketable fruit to the acre. Meanwhile, post office facilities spread out to meet the growing demands of the community. Without communication services, new far-flung settlements could not grow into an integral place in the young state. Tenuous lines of communication were gradually spun throughout the country over hazardous territory and into its farthest corners. People who had struggled alone were able to increase the effectiveness of their work through the lifelines of the mail, the telegraph, and later the telephone. In 1855, a survey was made for the first railway line, and a tender was submitted for 200,671 pounds, 18 shillings and eightpence. This contract includes all earthwork in cuttings and embankments in making a railway from Launceston to Deloraine, a distance of 45 miles, two chains, amounting to about 600,000 cubic yards. Fencing on both sides of the line, about 95 miles, level crossings, Geologically, the mountains in the west are older than the Alps, older than the Himalayas, older than the Andes. In 1881, an expedition discovered vast riches of copper-bearing ore in the Mount Lyle district. Not until 50 years later was the road built into this forbidding but fabulous country to Queenstown. The mine, gouged deep into the rock, has yielded more than 20 million pounds worth of ore and continues to yield thousands of tons daily. In the smelters, by-products of gold, silver, iron and sulphur are extracted from the ore to leave the pure copper. While Queenstown flourishes in splendid isolation, Zeehan, only 30 miles away, is almost a ghost town. This was once a mining town too, with a population of 9,000, the second largest town in Tasmania. Yet today, it has but 200 inhabitants. On the east coast at Coles Bay, there is a deposit of pink granite which has been formed by primeval earthquake pressures and disturbances. In the idyllic surroundings of the Freysenay Peninsula, it is quarried to adorn the facades of handsome buildings in the capital cities.
The laughter of running water sounds in a thousand valleys. Melting snow is channeled into a multitude of icy, clear streams. High, high in the tundras in the center of the island lies the Great Lake, from which the flow of water has been controlled to provide hydroelectric power. Embedded deep in the mountains are the power stations with great sheer dropping pipelines which carry the irresistible flow of water to feed the turbines. This harnessing of water power has assured Tasmania's progress, making possible the foundation of many industrial projects, both large and small, and greatly increasing the importance of the state as a whole. Transmission poles march across the country, bearing on their shoulders the power from which almost every Tasmanian may have light at the touch of a switch, whilst industrial projects, which would be uneconomical otherwise, can become a reality. One such industry, possible only in a land where water and electric power are plentiful, is the manufacture of newsprint from hardwood at the Boyer Mills near New Norfolk. From deep in the rain-soaked forests, timber is brought by train to the mill. Screaming, power-driven saws reduce the wood to billets. The billets are mashed to a pulp in huge vats under strong water pressure. Then the cataract of wet pulp is poured onto the long machine, which rolls, squeezes, dries and strengthens the pulp until the finished newsprint is rolled off at the end. Zinc production is one of Australia's most important industries. At Risdon, near Hobart, zinc is produced by the electrolytic process. Raw zinc sulphide from Broken Hill is converted into zinc oxide. Then comes the complex process of extracting the metal from the oxide, requiring a tremendous consumption of electric power. on the shore of the Tamar River, another major Australian industry is taking shape. Here, on an extensive site which has been carved out of the quiet bush, huge buildings are under construction for the manufacture of aluminium. Never before made in Australia, this precious, lightweight, modern magic metal, the metal of a thousand and one uses, will now be made here. Hand in hand with the forward march of Tasmania's industrial progress, there has been an expansion of communications facilities. The first telegraph cable was laid across Bass Strait in 1859, but as the island grew from an agricultural community to an industrial centre, the post office increased and amplified all its services. In 1936, the first submarine telephone cable was opened, and at last Tasmanians were able to speak direct to any part of the world. Today, radio networks have been established to assist in carrying the constant traffic in voices which is plied across Bass Strait. On the summit of the Nut at Stanley, aerial arrays for the reception and transmission of telephone calls are placed near the station where post office technicians work to keep the traffic flowing efficiently. Within the state, too, there has been a tremendous increase in the facilities to provide a flowing and efficient telephone service, one of the essentials for any modern community. Hobart, steeped in its own romantic history, continues to grow as a port while retaining its fascination for the thousands of people who visit it each year. Dominated by Mount Wellington, the town is set on an incomparable landlocked harbour on the Derwent estuary. On the pleasant waterfront at Constitution Dock, 
People may select their fish alive and buy them on the spot freshly caught from the sea. A fishing boat sets out to deliver mail and provisions to the lighthouse keeper at Tasman Island, for the post office must seek the most remote places. So sheer are the sides of Tasman Island that even the landing stage is 80 feet above the water, and from there it is necessary to descend in a basket on a cable. The lighthouse, 900 feet up, is reached by a tiny cable skip, which is hauled up the face of the cliff. And it is in this manner that mails, provisions, livestock and passengers make the ascent to the windswept heights. Mail for lonely people, food and supplies for those whose work keeps them in isolation from all their fellow creatures. Word from home, the magic friendly touch of letters for those whose only companions are the shrieking gulls and mocking wind. This is the meaning of warmth and friendship, that no man might be forgotten in his work. Back in the city, tourists, always fugitive from the noise and crowds of urban life, seek the space and isolation of the bush. Salamanca Place is unique among Australian waterfront streets. With its old stone warehouses, it is imbued with a feeling of the earlier days of sailing ships. Days more solid and leisurely than our own. New trolley buses pass the old cathedral. People sit under the trees to watch the world go by. Overlooking Franklin Square is the General Post Office, the active centre of the island's communications services the solid centre of a web of signals and messages embracing all distance and all people. Beyond St David's Park, the telephone exchange is concealed behind quiet brick walls. The first overland journey between Hobart and Launceston took eight days, but now the two cities are joined by arteries and nerves of road, of rail, telegraph, telephone, radio. Launceston, northern centre of the state, lies in a picturesque situation on the Tamar River, 40 miles from the sea. In a way, it is the parent city of Melbourne, for it was from here in 1834 and 1835 that Henty, Batman and Faulkner emigrated to found settlements in Victoria. Tasmania is a land of growing cities and growing industries. Its natural beauties make it a haven for visitors from many parts of the world. It is a young country still discovering its own riches. And what of the young and growing children here? What has been done about them? In fact, their education is one of the proudest achievements of the state. For many years now, small schools in isolated communities have been almost unknown. The children are brought from near and far to area schools to be educated in practical things as well as in formal studies. Here, they are prepared for the future. For theirs is the future. They will inherit the land with its growing towns, its mineral wealth, its fertile farms and its great natural beauty. It will be theirs to hold in trust and to mould for the generations that are to come.